And lo and behold, God gave him a message of forgiving. And so he prayed and fasted for several days before this, this evening me meeting in a tent, 100 people there. And he was the keynote speaker for some reason. They gave him the, the first address. And he said to me, you could hear a pin drop in the room because the message God had given him was to love your enemies and forgive mm. those who oppress you. Oh my gosh, wow. this was shocking. And there were six religious leaders, long bearded guys in the room. Mm -hmm. Some of them Hamas leaders who heard him at the end of the meeting. They said, brother, we need to come and speak to you. Mm. Hi guys, welcome back to Raw Mission. I'm Matt, your host for the podcast, and I'm now back in the cold English winter after a very exciting week of gospel opportunities in Qatar during the World Cup, which we can't wait to tell you about in a couple of weeks' time. Now some of us spend years in the Muslim world seeing just a little fruit, but confident that the Lord is preparing a harvest for the seeds we're sowing. Others though, like Jonathan in today's episode, have had the great honour of seeing remarkable fruit. Hundreds of Muslims finding forgiveness and freedom in Jesus. That was his experience in Lebanon, and I'm sure his story will really encourage you as you hear what God's up to in the Arab world. Well, today it's a real privilege for me to have a friend in the studio, an old friend. Jonathan, welcome to the studio. Thank you. It's great to be with you, Matt. Yeah, so let's jump straight in and tell us a little bit about your upbringing, different cultural backgrounds that you've had, and then take us forward to how you ended up living in Lebanon. Sure, with pleasure. So, um, yeah, I'm British American, born in France, grew up in France. I sound more American than British, but a lot of my, <laughs> a lot of what I say is actually British vocab okay. with an American accent is quite funny. Mm. But yeah, I grew up in the 70s and 80s in France. My parents were missionaries with mm. uh, an organization called Campus Crusade for Christ. And they actually set up Campus Crusade in France. It's not called Agape over here in mm -hmm. Europe or Crew in the US for any American yeah. listeners. So they were the pioneer workers who set up the org in, uh, in France, mm. working with students back okay. in the hippie era. That's good. Was it in one of the big cities in France? Or? They moved around a little bit. They were in Lyon, mm. and then which is where I was born, just outside Lyon. And mm. then they were in Paris as well, and so a few other smaller towns. Mm. Mm -hmm. So you grew up in a pretty cross-cultural environment. Did you go to international schools or French school? So we, we moved down to the south of France, to the famous uh, Côte d'Azur. So for the first 11 years of my life, I was in French schools. Mm. So, you know, learned French and was speaking French. So I grew up bilingual, really. Mm. And then from the age of 11 onwards, started going to an international school on the Riviera. Okay. And then, I mean, is that somewhere down on the south of France? You, you know, you often meet a lot of North Africans and other Indeed. cultures. Did, is, was that part of your school experience? Yes. So the school was highly, highly multicultural. And actually, the school's motto if I can quote the French, was enrichissons-nous de nos différences, which means let us enrich ourselves of our differences. Mm. A quote by the French philosopher Paul Valéry. And that was really the whole vision of the school was for kids come together from all over the world. Um, probably 30 or 40 different nationalities were represented mm. in the school. Very big school, very international. It was wonderful. So I had African friends, Middle Eastern friends, mm. European friends, American friends from all over the place. It was That's excellent. Cool great environment to grow up in. Yeah. And how did that connect then with your growing faith, I suppose, as a, as a teenager yeah. and so on, and then a heart for mission that developed out of that? That's right. So um, I had a very rebellious childhood. I had all my years of rebellion pre-teenager. <laughs> um, and uh, age 13, I was sent off to from the south of France to a Bible camp in North Wales. Um, and on that camp, I accepted Jesus. Uh, and it was pretty transparent transformative experience for me within probably literally weeks people could see the change in my life mm. and my parents were the first to notice that um, and so growing up in France was a really tough environment because at school I knew no other believers mm -hmm. my sister and I were the only believers that we knew of at least mm. and um, you know very secular environment France yeah. you know a lot of people would call themselves Catholic but they're, none of them actually go to church, even mm -hmm. as Catholics. Um, their parents and grandparents might, but they don't 
Um, yeah. Uh, so it was um, it was a very um, hard environment spiritually. But then just before turning 16, my dad got a job transfer and we moved to London. Mm. Um, and it's interesting because none of us wanted to come to England. We had this vision of 19th century smoggy London, really? Sherlock Holmes type. Yes. <laughs> That's how vision we had because yeah. we were like in the south of France, 300 mm-hmm. days of sunshine a year. You know, mm-hmm. why would you want to come to London? That's true. <laughs> but thank God we moved in August and it was beautiful and sunny and my mom who's British took us to all the parks in London and we're like wow this is cool we're like London and then started school at the the big uh, Lycée Francis Charles de Gaulle the big French Lycée in South Kensington okay so finished education there basically before then going on to university hmm. um, and it joined a really good um, youth group at uh, a big Anglican church, actually the first church plant from HTB. Anybody's mm-hmm. familiar with Holy Trinity Brompton? So they planted the first church in, in Kensington and we were going to that church and they had a great youth group. So that was a great space for me to really um, develop a deeper faith mm. before going on to university. Um, okay, and your mission calling developed at university then? It did, I would say it developed at university. So growing up in France, obviously, obviously surrounded by um, Muslim kids, not that many actually in the school, but just in the area where we mm. lived, there are a lot of North African um, Muslim families. And there was a lot of prejudice. Growing mm. up in France back in the 80s, tremendous prejudice against black Africans and North Africans, mm-hmm. Arab North Africans. So I, you know, I have to confess I grew up with that prejudice in mm-hmm. my heart. But then after coming to know Jesus, he started challenging that and changing my heart. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I was at university, uh, I did the Erasmus program back then. So that was the Inter-European Universities Exchange Program, okay. Erasmus. Yep. And I went back to France. I went to Grenoble in in France Mm -hmm. and uh, the capital of the Alps, beautiful part of France. And I was a student there for a year, a whole academic year. Um, And whilst there, the Lord really started uh, moving in my heart and laying a burden for Muslims on my heart. So I met this young uh, Franco-Algerian guy called Mm. Brahim. And he was alcoholic, drug addict, demonized, wow. you name it. Um, you know how Jesus talks about the, uh, the eyes uh, are the light of the, of the soul. Mm-hmm. You know, you see, and this guy's eyes were not like brown. They were black. Wow. Mm. I've never seen anybody's eyes so dark. Mm. But during the six months that I befriended this guy, his eyes changed color Mm. as literally a miracle. And my friends were scared of him. Like I would Mm. bring him back to the dorm and they were freaking out. And they're like, who's this guy? And they were like scared. (laughs) And I'm like, oh, he's just a guy I met. You know, Mm. he needs help. He needs Jesus. And they're like, don't bring him. We're scared of him. Blah, blah. (laughs) Six months later, he showed up at church one day Mm. because he knew where we went to church. So he was like living rough, living homeless. Mm. Most of the time he was squatting in some places. One day he showed up at church and my Colombian friend said to me, is that Brahim? We don't recognize him. Mm. His eyes, look at his eyes. And they could see his eyes had changed color. It was a remarkable experience. Mm. So those six or nine months of being with Brahim, God used to show me just how close Muslims are to the truth and yet how far they Mm. also are. So he had all these wild kind of folk Islamic belief systems mm-hmm. that he was, you know, he'd sleep with a copy of the Quran under his head. Mm. <laughs> and um, anyway, all this crazy stuff. And we'd, we'd have these deep conversations, but he was not a practicing Muslim. He was a nominal Muslim, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but that God, God basically used that year in France to really put that, that I would describe it as a, a call on my life mm. to dedicate myself to, to love and serve Muslims. That's awesome. That's when it began. Just to wrap that story up, did... Did Ibrahim come to faith eventually or did he just sort of fall away? It's really hard to tell. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I finished the academic so year, issues. moved back to England, lost touch with him. Yeah. But I remember this experience. I was actually sitting in a West End theater and this deep burden of prayer for him came upon me. And literally in the middle of this show, I started mm-hmm. weeping. Mm-hmm. It was weird. I was with my parents and my sister mm-hmm. and I was weeping in the spirit. And I literally feel I was interceding for his soul mm-hmm. in that moment. I don't know why I can't yeah. explain it, but it was a Holy Spirit moment. And I also felt afterwards, I think he's just died. Mm. And I was just like crying out for his soul. I don't know. Only God knows. Sure. Yeah, yeah. But uh, that was my experience with uh, Brahim. Okay, yeah. So that 
that had a big impact on you living, working in France amongst Muslims. And then at some point you joined Tear Fund. I did. I did. Back in the late 90s after graduating. So I went to the University of Kent in Canterbury, UKC, and then Mm. came back to London and um, joined Tear Fund. Mm. And I joined what was then called the Disaster Response Team. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were going to send me off to uh, Bujumbura, Burundi. Oh, wow. As a logistician, because I spoke fluent French. Yeah. But I, they were desperate for a French speaker. So I did all the security training with mm-hmm. radar and all these groups and stuff. And I was ready to go. Literally two weeks before I was going to get on the plane. I think they'd even booked my ticket, bought mm-hmm. my ticket. I got a phone call from the headquarters in Teddington. And they said, sorry, we're sending someone else. And mm-hmm. I'm like, what? <laughs> But I remember my father being really glad. And I'm like, Papa, why are you so happy? Mm. He said, I just didn't feel good about this. I had a bad sense if you went there. Mm -hmm. And what happened was that about a month after I would have gotten there, there was a carjacking. There were Mm. some bandits in the road. And Burundi was coming out of civil war Mm -hmm. context back in the 90s. And there'd been a carjacking and one of the tier fund employees, local employees, tried to defend the asset. And that's one of the first lessons you learn in security training. Don't defend an asset. Your life is more important than an mm-hmm. asset. Even a, even a four by four Land Cruiser, you let them take it. Yeah. yeah. And, and your life is more important. And that guy tried to defend the asset and was, was gunned down. And I'm pretty sure that I would have been the one who was defending the asset. <laughs> Not, I, not following the rules. Not following the rules. I'd have tried to play Superman and mm-hmm. try and got myself killed. I have yeah, just that sense. Interesting. And mm. I, <laughs> yeah, God's ways often yeah. higher than our ways, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. So I then left your fund, did some other stuff in London, all kinds of exciting projects I got involved with in London. Mm. And then went back to Tier Fund several years later and worked for what was then called the Disaster uh, Management Team, DMT. And uh, became logistics officer over the Liberia program and the Sudan and Darfur programs. Mm. And ended up going to Liberia um, just for a short visit, uh, never long term or anything like that. Mm. So that was my experience with Tierfund. So I came with a lot of, uh, I came out of those experiences with a lot of understanding about both relief and development work. Mm -hmm. And I was really grateful for those years at Tierfund. And and did that develop a heart for Africa in you? Did you ever think, oh yeah, maybe I'll serve in Africa one day? Less Africa, much more, again, my eyes were just turned to the Middle East. Mm. I was drawn to the Middle East, but I didn't know where. I didn't know, would it be like the Levant? Would it be the Gulf? Would it be, you know, Yemen? Or, Mm -hmm. and I visited all, I've visited all those countries since then. Mm. Um, And then ended up in Lebanon. Hmm. So how did that happen? <laughs> well, um, we, my wife and I, we had made a trip out to Lebanon and after a prayer trip that actually Frontiers had organized. Hmm. One of your colleagues, Matt, had organized this wonderful prayer trip to Tunisia mm-hmm. in 2004. And we had gone on that prayer trip. And one of the team leaders there had invited us to join their team and they were really happy to meet us. And Mm. we're like, wow, this is great, you know, and speak French here. So it's Mm. good for me. I'd have to learn Arabic, but, um, but we didn't quite feel it was the right thing. So then we, one of the guys who was leading the team, Ben, um, said, Hey, I'm moving to Lebanon next year and I'm going to be working in this Palestinian refugee camp in Beirut. Do you want to come visit? Or like, yeah, we'd love to come. Mm. And so we went And we had two weeks in Lebanon and it was just an eye-opening experience. Again, we were offered jobs in Lebanese evangelical school in in Louise, north of Beirut and in another place. Um, And then we spent the last 48 hours in Tyre, the ancient biblical city of Tyre, down south Lebanon, not far from the border with Israel. Okay. And during that time, the morning of the second day, I woke up and the wind was blowing. A very strong wind was blowing. And it's actually called the Sirocco wind from North Africa. It was mm. blowing all the way over to Lebanon. Hot wind. I guess. Hot wind mm. with this fine sand mm. that gets deposited everywhere. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, my spirit is at work here. And I was just excited. I remember mm. telling to my wife, you know, I, you, we came back to London and we were praying about this and we were seeing Lebanon this, Cedar that, restaurants, mm. you name it. It was like uncanny how God yeah. was speaking to us about moving to Lebanon. Mm. And so we entered into a, a conversation with the guy who became our team leader. And at first we were going to go for three months. And mm. then we get this long email from him saying, we've had some thoughts about this. And we're like, oh my gosh, they've decided not to invite us. Mm. 
And at the end of the email, I say, we think you should commit to a whole year rather than just come for three months. And we're like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So that meant actually quitting our jobs and like really dedicating ourselves to go like properly. Mm -hmm. Um, So we agreed. And um, we landed there in March 2006. Okay. Hmm. And at this point, did you have any children? We didn't. Not yet. Not yet. So we we launched straight into intensive language learning, which is one of Mm. the big values of our organization, really Mm -hmm. to get get enculturated, language Mm. culture. And so we spoke to our team leader and said to him, hey, you know, um, before we came out, we we were booked to go to this conference back home because we're part of this organization, this kind of parachurch missions organization. But we knew also that the rules were the first year you don't go home. You're mm-hmm. committed to language learning. You're committed to getting culturated. So mm. he basically made a, a special allowance for us. He said, I'll let you go back. You can go for two weeks, have a short break, and then come back. We're like, great, thank mm. you. So we were on the last commercial plane out of the country at 2 a.m. when a war broke out. Mm. So unbeknownst to us, a war broke out in South Lebanon. <laughs> so we're flying out of Beirut. We land in London, mm. and my parents were living in London back in those days. And I remember my father waking me up in the morning and said, Jonathan, Jonathan, get in here. Look at the TV. It's saying Beirut Airport's getting bombed. I'm like, Papa, mm. what are you talking about? We just flew from there last mm. night. You must be talking about a different country. Yeah. And sure enough, it was Lebanon. And I'm like, what the heck? You were just there. And it was insane. So all of my relief kind of background clicked in. Mm. And I went into relief mode. <laughs> and my wife barely saw me for mm. the following two weeks. And I could spend the whole of the rest of the podcast telling you story after story of what happened during that war. It was mm. intense. We basically, who, is it, who is the war between? And so the war, again, yeah. The area. Yeah, the war was between Israel and Hezbollah. Hezbollah is a uh, political, religious pol- a group in Lebanon, mm-hmm. Shia, Shia group in Lebanon that's really backed up by Iran, the big mm. power broker in that region. Um, and so basically a couple of Hezbollah soldiers that had gone over the border and snatched some Israeli guys. Oh, yeah and kidnap them mm. in a view to exchange them, do a prisoner swap mm-hmm. for some of their Hezbollah guys that Israel I, IDF, Israeli Defense Force, were holding. Right. And all hell broke loose. That was like yeah. the straw that broke the camel's back, and Israel launched mm. this full-on assault on Lebanon. Okay. And within days, they had bombed pretty much every single bridge in the country. Hmm. And they they paralyzed the airport. They did not damage the actual airport buildings, but they took out every single runway. Hmm. And then they set up a, a naval blockade along hmm. the coast. Because Lebanon's a very small country out in the eastern Mediterranean, mm-hmm. north of Israel, south and west of Syria. And so people couldn't leave by sea. Hmm. People couldn't leave by air. Wow. And they took out the Damascus Highway. There's a highway that goes from Beirut to hmm. Damascus. They they hit that highway. Mm. So basically, the Lebanese people and all those living in Lebanon, like us as workers, mm-hmm. were stuck in the country. Mm. And it took international diplomacy to open up. And basically, the, the, the navies of Western nations who had people you know, working in Lebanon mm. had to negotiate with the Israeli government to let their people out. And mm-hmm. so for days, there were, there were military vessels mm. picking up people and le- let them okay. out of the country. It was a pretty hair-raising experience. Wow. And so you're stuck in London. We're stuck in London. <laughs> thinking we just missed that. Oh, my gosh. Um, it was really crazy. What kind of relief could you do from a distance? Well, what happened, and again, this is where I could tell stories for hours. Mm. Um, the Lord connected me with some guy who I suspect was MI6 Mm. (laughs) agent, Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, who knew everything about us. He called me up out of the blue. Uh, We were driving to the conference that we'd gone back for. He called me up out of the blue and he says, hi, my name is so-and-so. You don't know who I am, but I know who you are. And I know everything about what you're doing in Lebanon. And I'm like, what the heck? Who is this? Mm. And he was very mysterious guy. He said, I'll call you back in an hour. Hmm. And then an hour later, he calls me back. He says, "Uh, you need to tell your guys to leave now. Hmm. And I'm like, who is this? And he wouldn't say who he was, Hmm. but basically he had intel. Hmm. (laughs) And he was feeding me intel. And basically our team leader had felt 
they'd stayed there the first, I think it was a week or nine days of the war. I think they stayed mm-hmm. in, in, in the South. And then the Lebanese themselves were fleeing mm-hmm. because they were expecting a full on onslaught mm-hmm. from Israel, like a, maybe Overland. a land, inv- land yeah. invasion, like they had done in the past. And so people were fleeing mm-hmm. and, um, our team leader was, what was, kept up in the night and he felt the Holy Spirit tell him it's time to go. So they joined a convoy and were heading out of Tyre. But bridges were being hit on roads that they would have taken. So this guy was feeding me intel and telling me, tell him not to take that bridge. Wow. I mean, it was insane. It was like, mm-hmm. it was like a book, mm-hmm. you know, and we were living this and I'm feeding mm-hmm. this by SMS wow. to my team leader. It was crazy. So a journey that should have taken them a couple hours, I think took them seven hours mm-hmm. and they took refuge in a convent north of Beirut because wow. Lebanon is a very interesting country in the mm. Middle East. It's about a third Christian and mm-hmm. two thirds Muslim. And then you throw in the Druze, <laughs> which are this, this offshoot of Shia Islam, mm-hmm. but they do not consider themselves Muslim at all. It's okay. interesting grouping. Mm. And then there's a handful of Jews mm. also in Beirut. And okay. even the government funded the reconstruction of the synagogue mm. after the Because the, the government War. does a lot of power sharing between those different yes. communities, right? Yes. Which is why Hezbollah is, is not technically in charge of the whole of Lebanon, but they have so much power Absolutely. in the south. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Okay. And then how, how and when did you get back out to Lebanon? So um, we ended up staying uh, that whole summer instead of just going for two, two weeks. We stayed the whole summer. Then we went back after the ceasefire was signed mm. between Israel and um, Hezbollah. Mm. Um, so it was a 34-day war. It only lasted 34 days, okay. but billions of dollars of damage. Yeah. So we were able to fly back. Mm. And we basically, that summer, uh, my wife had gotten pregnant with our first child. Okay. And uh, so we went back, we packed up our apartment and said to the team, look, mm. we, we feel it's probably right for us to just um, spend time in England. Maybe we'll wait for the baby to be born and mm-hmm. then we'll come back. Okay. So in effect, we spent about a year in England mm. and then took... Uh, three-month-old baby, four-month-old baby mm. back to Lebanon. Yeah. That's similar to us. In 2007. Headed to Pakistan, yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. And then, yeah, let's move on and, and tell us about what was going on um, in terms of reaching Muslims in your area. Had there been a history of that? Or what yeah. was the state of the church down there in Tyre? Great question. So um, our, our team leader had been, by the time we arrived, he'd been in country for 10 years. Mm. And um, there had been a few that had been in Lebanon before him, but had not lasted. They'd lost their visas or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, So the the team early on had a Lebanese uh, family, Mm -hmm. Maronites, who had felt the call of God to move down south, which Mm. is unheard of. Mm. Most Lebanese Christians have never even gone south Mm -hmm. because they consider it a war zone. (laughs) Even though there was no military altercation or anything, they just considered it a dangerous Mm. place. And we don't go south of the Litani. The Mm Litani is a river that runs in South Lebanon. Even the British government were giving advice in those days on their website. Mm. um, Don't go south of the Litani, very dangerous Mm. place, blah, blah, blah. (laughs) Um, So anyway, these guys... um, Abujad and Nimjad, as we call them in Arabic, um, were felt led to go. Mm. And they, as fluent Arabic speakers, because they're Lebanese, went down south and they started learning Muslim dialect of Arabic mm-hmm. that the locals speak. So they could understand them, but they were using expressions that they were not used to. Yeah. And this was a great lesson in contextualization. Mm. So they began teaching the team. So they, they basically joined the team mm-hmm. and they became really good friends with our team leader and his wife and others who joined the team by then. And they were coaching the team in really effective contextualized language learning. Mm. Um, and, you know, he would listen to the mosque, to the khutbah, the, the mm. Friday sermon in the mosque every Friday and listen to what they were preaching and said, OK, this is what the local mosque leaders are talking about. And we we're like, great. Well, we weren't there yet, but the team, the team members mm. were like, oh, this is exciting. Tell us more. And so it was just a real blessing to have those guys on the team early on. Mm. And. As they studied scripture, as they, you know, did what teams do, um, they realized that God had cursed Tyre. You know, you read Isaiah and Ezekiel, and there's whole chapters that talk about how Tyre was cursed by God. And they're like, wow, we feel called to be in this place. We better start praying 
that God would remove his curses over mm-hmm. the city, ancient curses that mm-hmm. take back thousands of years. And so basically over a period of nearly 10 years, they mobilized many, many prayer teams mm. to come into Tyre from all over the world, especially Americans, because most of the team mates were Americans. There were some mm. Brits as well. And there's a strong connection, isn't it, between Lebanon and the States anyway? Yeah, I guess and there's a, a strong Lebanese, connection. I think, That's right. Many, many LA Lebanese. Well, the Lebanese are the most amazing entrepreneurs. They're everywhere. They're everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so in West Africa, I met them in Liberia oh, and Sierra Leone. And yeah. in other parts of the world, I met Lebanese and mm. they're everywhere. Okay. They're amazing. I love the Lebanese. Yeah. <laughs> um, so... They, um, yeah, so they, they started mobilizing these prayer teams to come through. And one of the guys um, who was on the team back then was really good with spreadsheets. And he'd done this spreadsheet, clocking up the number of hours mm. that all these teams had prayed. And after 10 years, they had accumulated 10,000 hours mm. of prayer team intercession mm. for the city. And it was about that time that Matt, it's not his real name, came into the kingdom. Matt was a very... Uh, depressed young Palestinian refugee, mm. quite educated. He was an English teacher in one of the local UNRWA, United Nations Relief and Work Agency schools mm. that is set up by the UN for the Palestinian kids mm. in Lebanon. There are 12 camps, 12 Palestinian camps in Lebanon. Mm. And there are probably between half a million and three quarters of a million Palestinians wow. in Lebanon. And uh, there were three main waves of immigration 1948, Mm -hmm. when the state of Israel was created, a whole wave of um, Palestinians left the Holy Land. Then um, 67, the Six Day War, Mm -hmm. and 73, three main waves of emigration from the Holy Land into Lebanon, Jordan, and Syria, Um, and a little bit Egypt as well. But many went north into Lebanon. Mm. So he grew up in one of the three camps in Mm -hmm. Tyre. And a um, wonderful, wonderful guy. He's, he became my best friend mm. in, in Lebanon, Matt. And uh, so he'd come to faith. And that's a whole other story, <laughs> how he came to faith. Mm. But he came to faith. And almost within weeks of arriving, I was introduced to this guy. Maybe days, for all I know. I can't mm. remember. And we struck up a great friendship str- early on. And I started feeling the Lord say to me, you need to invest into this man. And so I'm like, wow, great. Well, he spoke English. That was great. Mm. I was trying to begin to learn Arabic. Mm. So basically, he and some of his buddies that he had led to the Lord uh, were in this Bible study, English language Bible study that one of our teammates was leading. Mm. So you say nice. It was nice that they were meeting together around the word, but it wasn't nice because the word wasn't spreading. Yeah. Why? Because it wasn't in their heart language. Yep. So several years later, once our Arabic got better, one of our teammates, who was from another org, um, had joined our team, had gone into a DMM training with David Watson up in Beirut. Hmm. And David Watson was doing a lot of training on what's called DMM, Disciple Making Movements. Okay. And he came back so inspired. And this guy had lived in Syria with his family, spoke fluent Arabic, hmm. Syrian dialect. He's like... We need to do DMM. We need mm. to do this. We need to. So we started applying these principles mm. and we started studying the word in Arabic mm. with these guys in their dialect using a contextualized scripture. Mm-hmm. Um, and it took off. And these guys were like, wow, we, you mean we can share this with our people? We're like, yeah, that's the whole idea. Mm-hmm. Go, read, obey, share, mm. you know, read, obey, share the basic principles of DBS, you know, discover Bible studies. Mm. Um And before long, these guys started pulling their friends and neighbors and colleagues together. And we're Mm. we're starting these new little groups were being planted all over the camps. Mm. Um, And it it grew, it grew at at first slowly, but then it started accelerating. And there were several catalyst moments that enabled the spread of the gospel to really take off. And I could share some of those if you want. Please do. Yes. So these are all Muslim background. Yes. uh, Palestinians who are living in South Lebanon. Palestinian refugees, Mm. all of whom had grown up Mm. in Lebanon. So one of Matt's best friend, we call him Ian, again, not his name, but to protect him. um, He's Bedouin. Bedouin Palestinian. Hmm. So in Lebanon, the Bedouins are a significant minority group amongst the Palestinians. And there are also Lebanese Bedouin, just Hmm. to complicate things. Sharing this podcast is a really good way to encourage more people to get involved with God's great mission, whether locally or globally. So please do help us get the word out there. 
If you use an iPhone, it's pretty easy to write us a review, and that has a big impact on how many people can find us. Alternatively, you could share one of your favourite episodes with your church family or home group or see you, either in person or on WhatsApp or social media. Thanks, guys, and now let's get back to the podcast. In Lebanon, the Bedouins are a significant minority group amongst the Palestinians, and there are also Lebanese Bedouin, just mm. to complicate things. Now, they don't have camels and they don't live under tents anymore. They're sedentary and Mm. they live in the towns and villages around the place. Now, he lived outside of one of the camps, but it was a a settlement. They called them settlements Mm -hmm. just outside the main city. And he was based there. Mm. Also also a UN teacher. Mm. He was teaching science, whereas uh, Matt was teaching English. Mm. So they started pulling their friends together and really started sharing with people. And one day, Matt was invited to speak in a gathering, and this was after one of the this was after one of the uh, altercations between Hamas and Israel hmm. in in Gaza. Okay. So Hamas is one of the main uh, Islamist Palestinian movements that has a very strong anti-Israel rhetoric. And so the Palestinians have felt they've suffered extremely under Israeli occupation, as Mm -hmm. they describe it. Um, We won't get into the politics of that now. That's for another podcast. Um, But so Matt had been invited to speak at this gathering Mm. in Lebanon about the situation going on Mm. in Gaza. And, Mm. you know, and he told us, he said, guys, brothers, pray for me. I've been invited to speak as a well-known, you know, respected teacher in the community I'll be speaking in front of a hundred men, all gathered. And he said to me, what happens usually at these gatherings is everybody's like waving their fists. You've seen it on your TV screens. Mm -hmm. Death to Israel, death to Israel. All this kind of chanting, really stirring up emotions against the enemy, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, He said, pray for me. I really feel the Lord wants me to share something. So I'm like, okay, great. So we got the foreigners, you know, the expats all praying for Matt. And lo and behold, God gave him a message of forgiving and so he prayed and fasted for several days before this this evening me- mm-hmm. meeting yeah. in a tent 100 people there and he was the keynote speaker for some reason they mm-hmm. gave him the, the first address and he said to me you could hear a pin drop in the room because the message God had given him was to love your enemies and forgive mm-hmm. those who oppress you oh my gosh wow. this was shocking and there were six religious leaders, long bearded guys in the room, mm-hmm. some of them Hamas leaders who heard him at the end of the meeting. They said, brother, we need to come and speak to you. Mm. And he was like, OK, <laughs> what trouble. do you do? Am I yeah. in trouble? You know, and so at the end, he, he shared late at night. He sent me a message. I remember saying, yeah, 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 yeah. That's my name in Arabic. Yeah, yeah. This is what happened. Mm. But these guys want to come to my house in two days time. Mm. Please keep praying. (laughs) And so we kept praying. We're like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? And he basically welcomes his people. And, you know, in Arab culture, you have the tea ceremony. You Mm. drink tea. You serve little sweets and little juices. You do all this stuff for 10, 15 minutes of pleasantries. And then the most senior person in the room will speak. Okay. That's what happens in Arab culture. So the senior Islamic sheikh stood up and well, I probably didn't stand up. He just spoke. Mm. And he said, brother, what you shared the other night, we have never heard before. And we want to know more about that. Ooh. Matt was like, he just saw it as a green light. Mm. So he basically, by the, he spent the whole rest of the evening sharing more of the gospel with these Islamic leaders. Wow. And so he, by the end of the evening, he, they all walked away with a copy of the New Testament mm. in contextualized Arabic. And he said, hey, if you'd like to gather, we can meet next week. And look mm-hmm. at what this book is saying. And they're like, yeah, we'd like to do that. So of the six, three of them started meeting with him weekly. And basically, mm-hmm. cut a long story short, two of them came into the kingdom, were baptized. Mm. These are Hamas leaders. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> and incredible work of God. And they started meetings in the mosque. Mm. And they started drawing people who were interested in knowing more. Oh, it was incredible. So that was the first catalyst moment mm. that enabled this emerging movement to start to spread. Hmm. That's amazing. And so... To begin with, how public was this? I mean, in, they're doing this in the mosque, bringing people in to study, I guess, the Injil, the Gospels, and so on, and the teachings of Jesus. And was it just sort of word of mouth, quite quiet at that point, or was it fairly open? 
Because it was happening in the mosque, in terms of what the leaders were doing, the Islamic leaders, particularly these two guys, mm. uh, it was quite public. Mm. And they didn't get any pushback and or one, opposition. And one of the top, one of the guys was a senior leader in the whole of the South. Mm. Now, what happened was, and this was, I think, if my memory serves me, so this was, this was 2010. This all happened in 2010, so 12 years ago, okay. this was happening. So there'd been several years of them just as, as normal guys meeting together, having mm. Bible studies. And then this opportunity arose in, I think it was 2010. Mm -hmm. um, the top Islamic leader who started you know, coming to faith in the South was called up to Beirut, to the headquarters. Mm. And he was reprimanded. And it's, it's like the whole book of Acts all over again. Mm. He basically said to them, look, what God has shown me and put in my heart I will not keep quiet about. Hmm. You can you can try and you know shut me up, but I'm going to keep speaking, and he did. Wow. And to this day, he continues to share. That's now amazing. he has to do it very sensitively. Mm -hmm. And some of, some of the brothers started saying, "Do you think you should leave Hamas? You know, because mm -hmm. they're so, at so much at odds with the gospel message." He said, "No, I feel I need to stay re within my community, mm -hmm. but be salt and light." Mm -hmm and bring the yeast of the kingdom from within that community. Mm. So life has not been easy for him. And to be honest, I don't have a lot of stories of what's happened in intervening years, sure. but I do hear every once in a while, because I'm still in touch with Matt and Ian, mm. and that's a real pleasure for me to hear, you know, fresh news of the growing movement mm. happening there. So now this emerging movement has grown to just under 500 believers and around 100 seekers who meet in the study groups. And they've spread to across, well, they've spread across around five or six, possibly eight of the 12 Palestinian camps in Lebanon. Mm, and again, amazing. different things happen to open up opportunities for ministry in other camps in different parts of the country. Mm. Even most recently, uh, after the terrible fire that hit the port of mm. Beirut in 2020, I think it was yeah, summer 2020. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we basically were able to fund uh, some relief work mm. and we helped 826 families mm. who lost their livelihoods overnight because they were dock workers yep. and because the port was completely destroyed, they lost their livelihoods overnight. Mm. So that's thousands of people that we were able to help mm. through this, this project mm. that these Palestinian leaders from the south were running up north okay. in Beirut. So they could go up and they visit were going, and, they were getting access to the camps and you know, yeah. it was all awesome. Wow. And and our our former team leader, still there, was overseeing this from the mm -hmm. south and, and, and you know mm -hmm. it was we were able to get cash to them, but it's been really difficult because of the financial situation in Lebanon. Mm. Almost impossible to send money into the country. So often you have to carry cash in. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, this is wonderful, Jonathan. Just this is what Frontiers is all about, isn't it? Amen. Taking the gospel to places, to peoples um, where it's been so hard for the church to be born, to thrive, to grow, because there's so often so much opposition, persecution, or just cultural yeah, difficulties with that. And yet, here's a story where hundreds are coming to faith. Yeah. And it may be quietly, it may not be public, but they're true followers of Jesus. Yes. They've they've found the truth of the gospel and, and they're living it and yes. they're sharing it. Yes. And that's, that's the beauty. Yes. And not everyone will see that in their lifetime. That's right. Um, but this is somewhere we can really rejoice because yeah. it's happening. Yeah. A couple of things to add, perhaps. These mm. guys still call themselves Muslims. Mm. And you know, in Arabic, what does the word Muslim mean? It means submitted to God. Mm -hmm. You know, I had people tell me, Lebanese people come up to me, but they would watch me and observing me for months, if not years. And they said, Yahya, you are a better Muslim than we are. I'm mm -hmm. like, what do you mean by that? And they would start explaining to me, well, we witness you reading your holy book. We witness you praying. Mm -hmm. You're serving the poor. You're doing this. You're doing all these different mm -hmm. things. You're, you're, you're a better Muslim than we are. Because mm -hmm. we know what our religion tells us to do. Uh, we don't do it. And they were at least had enough self-awareness and yeah. uh, honesty to recognize that. But they would often say, you're a better Muslim. And I would never say, no, 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 I'm a Christian. Mm. I actually, in Arabic, we would use different expressions to describe us ourselves as disciples of Jesus. Mm. As, al -Masih, you know, mm. Jesus the Messiah. Um, and we would find ways of describing things because, again, a place like Lebanon, the word Christian is laden, sadly, mm. with a lot of pain and baggage mm -hmm. because guess what during the civil war from 1975 to 1990 muslims were killing christians mm -hmm. and christians were killing muslims and so there's all this baggage mm -hmm. and so 
you know, a lot of us, we felt that we don't want to carry labels yep. that immediately make people think, oh, if they're Christian, that means that. Yes, it's politics. No, or it's we don't want that. This, we don't want or, any yeah. of that stuff. So people would get to see us and watch us. And we hoped that our lives would speak volumes mm. as we were loving the poor, as we were praying, as we were offering to pray for the sick all the time. Mm. Um, and people were drawn to Jesus in us. Mm. We witnessed that many times. Yeah. And this, I mean, it's, we do sometimes talk about this and in theological missiological circles there's this phrase called insider yes, movements yes um and i think it's quite often misunderstood yes uh and yeah i just want to say to our listeners that you know if you're hearing about insider movements where someone might retain a cultural identity as being muslim but saying also that they're followers of jesus or isa that there's a huge volume of yeah. literature and so on about this that could really unpack that and help explain that. Yes. It's not simple as black and white just to say, are you for this or are you against this? It's yes. highly complex, yeah. theologically, missiologically, culturally, anthropologically. So I've got some fantastic articles from mm. journals that I've read, and I'd happily send that to anyone who would like to hear more about this. Great. But yeah, we, you know, we very much you know want to encourage those who are coming to Christ from a Muslim background to be yes. true to scripture, Amen. to leave what they should leave behind, but, you know, take on what they should take on of the gospel. Yes. And, and that's a battle, isn't it, all the time Absolutely. to work out what should be left behind. Yes. I chatted about this a, a couple of episodes ago with uh, Rahman, or maybe it was the last mm. episode, who's from a Muslim background. And we were talking about animism and yes. in West Africa and his Islamic background and just working out what is neutral and can be held on to. Mm in that cultural Amen. sense and what is you know definitely unbiblical yeah. or yeah. goes against god's grace yeah. and what must be left behind but I, you know complex I'm absolutely matt mm. and i i would gladly take any of your listeners with me if i was allowed back into lebanon i'm actually blacklisted still <laughs> but i would gladly take them and mm. introduce them to matinean and mm. some of their brothers and they would be touched by the humility of their lives, mm. by the transformation that has happened in their lives, by their devotion to scripture, mm. their prayerfulness. I mean, Matt, I remember telling me he used to pray two hours a day. How many British Christians pray two hours a day? Wow. He said, my first hour, I just worship, mm. you know, in different ways. And my second hour, I intercede. Mm. And he says, this is, I need to do it to survive. You know, he would say mm. to me. I don't know if he still does two hours a day, but that mm. was that's a kind of DNA they've yeah. they've imbibed and they've they've really mm. living out. And many of these guys, they may still culturally identify themselves as Muslims, but it doesn't sure. mean they necessarily will still go to the mosque or still absolutely be deeply involved at that level. Absolutely. And, and you know, they're all there's a sliding scale it's of a, how right. how they identify. Yes. It's just too yes. easy to say, oh, it's black and white. You that's should right. do this. You should do that. I just want to add one more uh, little PS. Um, there has been um, a Christian church, for example, in the South historically. So mm -hmm. even before we as, as expat workers mm -hmm. arrived, there was an existing church there. Sadly, what our team leader and the teammates back then discovered, they had no heart for Muslims. Okay. They were not interested. They saw them as mm -hmm. all going to hell. What's the point of wasting our time mm -hmm. with them? And that was, I would say, before the war in Syria, the view, sadly, that many Arab pastors had mm. in the Levant region. The war in Syria did something because when they started seeing millions of Syrians leaving, fleeing their country, some of whom were Christian Syrians, others Muslim Syrians, mm -hmm. fleeing Syria, they landed in churches in Beirut. They landed in churches in Amman, Jordan. Mm. And these pastors, these Arab pastors started feeling a burden for these refugees from Syria and started loving them. Mm. And I think the Holy Spirit used that. And this was, this started 10 years ago to really change um, some of the hard attitudes that Christian pastors, Lebanese or Jordanian mm. uh, pastors had about Muslims. Mm. And, and that's a beautiful thing we have to celebrate. So there has been a church but there was not a lot of partnership opportunities mm, with them because there there was a closed mentality, mm -hmm. a closed mindset. Yeah. And not just is that common sometimes in the Middle East or even where we were in Pakistan, but we have to be challenged by that here, don't we? Yes. In the UK context sure. or in the, the Western church context, because it's easy for us actually to feel the same. Yeah. Well, we just want to reach people who look like us or... Right. Um, you know, have lived here many, many years in this country. Was, well, hang on. What about the new neighbors? What yeah. about the refugees coming in here, the immigrant communities? Yeah. Do we care? That's yeah. right. 
20,000 Pakistanis on our doorstep or Bangladeshis in our community in London or Somalis coming in or Mm -hmm. Hong Kong Chinese, whoever actually. That's right. Um, You know, we must catch God's heart for all people and not harden our hearts. Yes. Amen. Amen. So, Jonathan, tell me more about, I don't know, any anecdotes you've got of just life in Lebanon. We haven't really heard what, what was it like to live there. Okay, it's quite a modern country in some it ways. It is. It is in many ways. But what I were think. the challenges? Yeah. So, so Lebanon is a fascinating place because in Beirut, you have billionaires mm. who live in their penthouse apartments in the flashy areas of suburbs mm. of, of Beirut. And then you have places like the Dahye, which is the poor Shia suburbs of southern Beirut, mm-hmm. where literally, particularly right now, where in the last couple of years, the, the Lebanese economy has completely tanked and mm. completely crashed. The, the Lebanese lira has devalued 85%. And probably right now, there are people who don't know where their next meal is coming from mm. in, in, Leba- in Beirut That's and across sick. Lebanon. It's a very, very s- stark mm. situation. It shocks me when I hear a story of what the situation is like in, in Lebanon right now. But when we were there, so we lived there from 06 to 2013, Life in Lebanon was wonderful in so many ways, you know, a beautiful country, amazing people, incredible food. Um, But there were some aspects of life that were quite hard as well, Mm, Uh, particularly in the summertime from around June, July ish, all the way to September. We would hit 90 percent humidity Mm. in in the indoors, outdoors. It was just intense heat. Uh, and it's not like dry heat, which I'm happy, like 40, 45 degrees. I've been out in the desert, that dry mm-hmm. heat, no problem. But the humidity just saps you of the energy mm-hmm. and it just, it just it's exhausts Always sweating. Always, always wet. sweating. You have a shower, five minutes later, you're dripping in sweat again. <laughs> yeah. So that was, that was hard. And then we had the joy of cockroaches. <laughs> and uh, you've probably seen cockroaches in different parts of the world where you've been, Matt. But in Lebanon, we would get these little cockroaches, well, anything between one and two inches long, mm. and they would fly. And I think my worst experience of a cockroach, I was busy doing the dishes. It was in the summertime and I was, you know, sitting, standing on the marble floors because in the Middle East, a lot of the floors are marble mm. to cool the places down. And I'm just, you know, doing the dishes. And all of a sudden I started feeling really itchy on my chest. <laughs> I'm like scratching myself. And this itch just wouldn't disappear. And I was wearing a, an open uh, shirt and I looked down my shirt and this cockroach was climbing up my chest. Yeah. And I'm like, ah! <laughs> so, so I'm going like this, trying to get this cockroach off me. And then it flew away. It was just <laughs> disgusting. Mm. That was my worst experience of cockroaches for sure. But the boys, when they were little, they would often just catch the cockroaches and play with them. We were always <laughs> concerned that they might eat them as well. Oh, <laughs> nasty. And we had mosquito nets to guard against the, mm. the mosquitoes coming through. Mm. We had tons of mosquitoes as well. Yeah, that's uh, definitely one of the challenges of hot countries often isn't it yeah the bugs and the yeah. creepy crawlies and things okay um yeah what else any other challenges or regrets you might have um one regret i i definitely have looking back is you know life was going so well ministry is thriving these palestinian brothers i was sowing into were really you know sharing the gospel and this this apostolic passion that they had and it was like 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, 2, you know, they were going and doing likewise mm. as we're instructed to do. And so things were going well, work was going well with the NGO, but I was really pretty, um, pretty stretched with the NGO work that I was doing there. Mm. And I was desperate to try and recruit people to join the team and help me in the NGO. And uh, people showed interest and then ended up joining other teams. So that was quite disappointing. Um, so I was probably on the verge of burnout uh, mm. when we got kicked out of the country, actually. But I think in the years building up to that, I think looking back, I, I really neglected investing more into, you know, relationships closest to me, like my wife. And I have a lot of regret over that. I don't think I'd describe myself as a workaholic. You know, you, you see these people who are workaholics who are working 50, 60 hours a week and mm. all they care about is making more money. I was definitely not interested in that. But I was sowing a lot into the NGO and the ministry. But um, I, I, I think, yeah, with hindsight, I recognize I was not investing as much as I should have into my, my relationship with my wife. Mm. And that obviously had, um, had knock-on effects later, mm-hmm. uh, sadly. Um, yeah, so it's, I, it's a common 
challenge actually, mm. isn't it, for those um, doing what we do yes. overseas? Um, all the sort of excitement plus obligations plus um, passion, calling, and but if that all kind of converges too much for us in doing what we feel called to do, um, this is for God. This is for God. This is so exciting. Yeah. We we can easily fall into that trap. I think can't That's we? That's right. Um, neglecting those around us. That's um, right. Yeah, and, and that doesn't have to be just husbands it could be wives who do the same um, but sure. it's a bit, yeah, I think that's a good challenge for all of us whatever we're doing yeah. um, whatever our work or ministry situation is yeah. so thanks for sharing so my, you're welcome my, my team leader used to often talk about establishing those little equilibriums in your life hmm. and I've remembered that ever since and you know he was really talking about you know how's your obviously how's your relational life doing how's your physical health doing how's your mental health doing how's your spiritual health doing and mm. is there a balance in your life mm. and is there this kind of holistic um equilibrium balance in in your life and mm. I, I think that was really wise of him to exhort us for for the guys on the team to really think mm. about those little equilibriums yeah that's good because i mean i think more and more in the last few years there's been an understanding of we're missing something. There are lessons we can learn, aren't there, from the yeah. Desert Fathers, the Desert Mothers, yes. about slowing down spiritual practices Absolutely. with um, books coming out by John Mark Comer, like The Ruthless mm -hmm. Elimination of Hurry. Another one, uh, Pete Scazzaro and his writings, The Emotionally Healthy Leader. He's yes. so good on, on exactly what you're talking about. We're whole people. Yes. So we, we mustn't neglect different aspects of our lives, our relationships, yes. especially those close to us. Because, um, yeah, because we're called to be with the Lord, to be with our family, as much as we're called to serve Him and do anything. Amen. Um, so both those are, you know, so important, aren't they? Yes. yes. Yeah, great. Thank you for that challenge. Any favorite verse that's just sustained you or blessed you or mm. you want to challenge us with as, as we wrap this up? Yeah, so there's, there's a verse that comes to mind immediately. Um, and it's a verse that I, I really was drawn to um, years before heading to the field. I'd actually done a, a short module at All Nations mm. uh, Christian College in Hertfordshire, and it was on ethnomusicology, ethno ethno music, basically. And one of the verses that had drawn my attention was Psalm eighty six nine, where it speaks about. Um, he has ordained praise from every people group. And the word mm. for people group in the Hebrew is goyim, which basically means Gentiles, all Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And so I, I developed this vision of hoping to go to the Middle East and seeing God raise up this indigenous worship from the hearts of the new believers. Mm. And I remember with the, the, the Palestinians that I was working with, you know, I remember had doing Bible studies with them and sharing from scripture about worship and it was falling on flat ears and I'm like, oh, don't you get it? You know, this is what God wants to see happen. And, mm. and one thing that was really beautiful is maybe a month or so before we got kicked out of the country, I remember getting a, a message on Viber. We were using Viber in those days before WhatsApp. And, uh, my brother Matt was sharing with me, um, Hey, last night we had our, our usual meeting together. This is him and his insider believer friends. Mm -hmm. And I felt led to share a psalm with them. And that led other brothers in the group to start writing poems. And it's like they were writing modern day psalms. Mm. And then one guy just got up, left the room and came back with an oud, which is this very traditional Arab instrument. It's a bit like a lute. Mm, and he cool. started playing and putting these poems to music. And I'm like, wow, this is beautiful. This is exactly what I've been talking to you about for years. Oh, awesome. And I was encouraging them and say, yeah, you have to really, you know, invest into this and see what comes out of this. Mm -hmm. But they were starting to pour their hearts out before the Lord, as it says in Psalm 62. And just doing this with their own instruments mm. and writing their own psalms. And it was like beautiful, like mm. Palestinian worship emerging. That's and I was really excited to see that just before we had to leave. Mm. Wow, so, what a great note to end on. It yeah. was. Every yeah. tribe, every tongue worshiping in their own language. It's, obviously, it's a, it's a biblical picture of heaven as well. Yeah. So. yeah. Great. Well, thank you for being with me today. So, so encouraging to hear these stories, yeah. what's going on out there in Lebanon and, and how God's used you guys. Yeah. Um, so, Thanks yeah, for the invitation. bless you for all of that. And we'll keep praying for the nation and the people out there. Please do. And yeah. pray for Matt and Ian and these other leaders that are there mm. really serving God faithfully and seeking to really see his kingdom expand amongst their own people and pray as well. 
that what God has started doing amongst the Palestinians in Lebanon would spread and jump mm. the sectarian divide so that actually Shia Lebanese can start to be impacted mm. with the gospel. Wouldn't it be amazing if these Sunni background insider believers started sharing boldly with the Lebanese Shia? That yeah. would be really exciting. So we've been so praying good. for that for yes. many years. Amen. Join us. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, Jonathan. Great to be with you today. Great to be here. God bless you. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much for joining us today, guys. For more, check us out on our website, frontiers.org.uk and on all social media platforms at Frontiers UK. Have a great week and make sure you don't miss our next episode. 